the new statistics, estimation and research integrity. Good day and thank you for coming. These are exciting times right across many scientific disciplines as fundamental assumptions are being challenged and new proposals put forward for big changes to how we do our research. And it's challenging because really every researcher needs to engage with these issues and decide what's the best thing to do in their own particular research situation. Particularly challenging because this is a moving target. New things are happening. The aspect of these changes that I'm going to spend most time on is what I call the new statistics. Effect sizes, confidence intervals, and meta-analysis. In a word, estimation. Now these are not new techniques. They're widely used in some fields, but they would be very new uh, in our discipline and across biomedicine and in many other disciplines. And in my view, it would be a terrific step forward if we really adopted them widely. I'm going to offer you some pictures and uh, mental movies, and I hope that these can help uh, build and reinforce good intuitions about some important statistical concepts, especially sampling variability, which is so tricky, usually embarrassingly large, but at the core of all we do as researchers. So, watch out for the dancers. There are six sections. The first two, the new statistics, why? Including research integrity. And then four sections, the new statistics, how? Picking out a few examples and lots on confidence intervals. Later on, precision for planning, which seems to be a new technique full of potential. And then meta-analysis wrapping things up. Well, that's what meta-analysis does. There's a book. And nearly everything I talk about today is discussed in more detail in the book. So the first section, confidence intervals, NHST, null hypothesis, significance testing, and p-values. Let me start with an example. This is a recent paper reporting a double-blind, randomized control trial, gold standard for providing evidence. And it evaluated a claimed anti-aging cream uh, to improve wrinkles in the aged skin. I'm getting interested in this. And it reported a statistically significant improvement in facial wrinkles, P.01, quite a clear result. And the placebo cream, no sign of significance, P.11. This was um, uh, announced loudly in the British tabloid press under headlines, significant clinical improvement in facial wrinkles and queues formed outside Boots the Chemist up and down Britain to buy number seven protect and perfect intense beauty. That they pay people to write this stuff. Now, just keep that pattern in mind. We seem to have something quite clear. And think about this picture. What does it shout at you? We have two findings here, a mean and a 95% confidence interval. No labels at this stage. If I put some labels on, you can see where I'm going, can't you? And if I put another label on, you see that what we have is an alternative representation of exactly the same result. And in fact, if we have a 95% confidence interval here with one end of it this far away proportionally from zero, then P is 0.01. And similarly here, P is 0.11. First point is that there's an intimate relationship between p-values and estimation as represented by these confidence intervals. Give me one and I can tell you the other. But they tell us very different things. Or we think about them in different ways is my contention, importantly different. And just looking at the p-values, we were strongly tempted, I suspect, to say, well, here we've clearly got an effect and here we don't have any evidence of effect. Now, if we conclude, therefore, there must be a difference, an important difference, then we are, in effect, 
accepting an null hypothesis here. And every good statistics book tells us that we shouldn't do that, at least not without a lot of careful investigation. But these p-values seem to lead us into this temptation to think dichotomously. NHST, dichotomous thinking, an effect exists or it doesn't, uh, reflecting, uh, we conclude that based on the p-value. Now, it's a common error to compare p-values rather than look at the difference as we should, but we can't dismiss it because it's very frequent in even our top journals. And so I can summarise so far that presentation format does matter, hardly a surprise to psychologists. NHST encourages dichotomous thinking with this seductive but illusory idea, illusory idea of certainty. But confidence intervals in contrast, I suspect promoted a much more justifiable reaction that we have two results that are quite consonant, quite similar, quite supportive. And they're highly informative anyway by concentrating on the positive information about where the true value is likely to lie. Making beautiful music with confidence intervals. Now, of course, you're not going to be convinced just by one little party trick or what I say, and that's very proper. You want evidence. And relevant evidence here, importantly, includes cognitive evidence. And this is a great opportunity for psychological science, because when you think that hundreds of disciplines, however many there are across science, use statistics one way or another, we're the only discipline who can really um, study empirically how people understand important statistical ideas and in what, uh, what presentations lead to good conclusions or to misperceptions. So here's um, uh, an article we wrote about statistical cognition. If you're interested in stats and in cognition, I suggest you, I invite you to consider working in this area. There are lots of very important questions to be investigated and we can make a contribution across science by guiding how people in other disciplines do their statistics. Here's a little example. We sent this picture to a whole lot of people who published in top medical and psychology journals. And there's a little cover story and we asked them, please um, rate on a seven point scale to what extent, no calculations, just eyeballing, you judge these two findings to be similar, consistent, supportive, or different and disagreeing and raising the question, why is there a difference? Then we asked them, please just give us a few words why you made that rating. And the interesting thing was that those folks, about half the respondents, who invoked statistical significance testing in their explanations, about half did that. And so they would say things like, well, one significant, one isn't. Um, one overlaps zero, one doesn't. One rejects, one doesn't. Whereas the other half, they didn't refer, they didn't invoke significance testing. Now in our email to these folks, we'd sent them a picture and said they were confidence intervals. No mention of p-values or significance or null hypothesis at all. So these half the respondents invoked themselves in HST this other half did not. And they made comments like, well, they're pretty wide, aren't they? Or don't they overlap a lot? And the interesting thing was that folks who mentioned significance testing, 60% or so rated the two as somewhat different, disagreeing. But more than 90% of those who did not mention significance testing rated the two as agreeing, a much more justifiable conclusion. If you did this study and got this result, and then you replicated precisely and got this result, you would be happy. You could hardly um, expect to get a result more similar. So what do I conclude from this little study? First, that alas, quite a few people, even if we give them confidence intervals, they will themselves invoke significance testing. Somehow it's so deeply entrenched in our thinking that that's the way we feel we need to arrive at conclusions, even when we have much more informative confidence intervals presented to us. Uh, second point, that um, we do in fact uh, make better conclusions 
very frequently. If we think in terms of the intervals themselves and we resist any temptation to think in terms of p-values. And so think of these intervals as overlapping and draw our conclusions there without invoking NHST. Now, the third conclusion is a little bit of a leap, but we put it forward tentatively that it would be better to report this result, and maybe others, just using confidence intervals and not using p-values at all, because that presumably reduces the um, temptation to invoke NHST, and you're likely to make better conclusions. So that's a little example of statistical cognition. And it's the sort of thing that led us to focus on estimation as the thing we want to explore, study with statistical cognition, and then advocate. Well, maybe this is Fiona Fiddler and leading the crusade. P-values. Don't we love our P-values? Hold them close. You know, one of the really interesting things is how little we know about how people think about p-values. It's a great topic for research. There's documentation of um, a certain uh, range of misconceptions, but learning about p and learning the norms and the practices and the expectations associated with p is a very large part of being a graduate student and becoming enculturated into some research field. And yet that's been very little studied. People typically learn, I believe, a lot more about p-values than any textbook tells them. So given we know so little, I'm going to speculate. And I speculate that we tend to think, there are some exceptions, but we tend to think of p as a measure of strength of evidence. Now this is quite sensible. It's following Ronald Fisher, that a small p-value is stronger evidence against a null hypothesis. A small p-value gives you stronger reasons to doubt the null hypothesis, and that makes sense. Some people will say, therefore, if we um, clean up the way we use p-values, we'll have a valuable measure. I'm not convinced myself. I'm going to argue that actually we should do away with them. And I think um, I agree that one of the main problems is the way we think about them has these artificial criteria that really underpin a version of dichotomous thinking. But let's just speculate a little more. I speculate that um, we think in terms of stars and these intervals of p-values and that there's language associated with that. Highly significant approaching significance. How do you know that it's not running away from significance as fast as it can go? And this achingly, we want to know about the world, we want to know truth, and this language achingly tempts us to think truth. There is an effect or there is not. And there's affect associated with this. Emotion. I mean, I'm sure, not you, of course, but you know people who frantically scroll through their SPSS output. Where is it? Where is it? Where? There it is. Oh, oh. And this will be their reaction based on how P falls in relation to one of these arbitrary cutoffs. But it matters. The world bases decisions on these things. Now, I'm only speculating. But perhaps you recognize a little bit of this. Well, if P values tell us truth, presumably, if we did the experiment again, they should tell us more or less the same truth. So suppose you do a study and you happen to get P of 0.05, and you replicate it, exactly the same but with a new sample, what are you going to get as a p-value? Well, not 0.05 precisely, of course, but you're going to get sort of 0 0.04, or 0 0 0.04, 0.06, or 0 0.03, 0 0.07, or what sort of range do you need to think about as likely to uh, include the p-value you'll get on a replication? Hmm. If p-values tell us truth, this should be fairly narrow range, surely. Let's explore this with simulation. And I'm going to use um, exploratory software for confidence intervals, ESCII, runs under Excel, 
uh, a free download from this site and I invite you to uh, use it and um, may it serve you well. Now I'm supposing I'm going to do a two independent groups study, each group 32 participants and that we have two underlying populations, maybe this scale up here is well-being and the experimental group, experimental population here, normally distributed, mean 60, standard deviation assumed known of 20, they're the people maybe who are visiting San Francisco at the moment and the folks in the control condition are not. And on average, the San Francisco visitors have a 10 point higher well-being score, as you will recognize. So this is a population effect size of half a standard deviation, 10 divided by 20, Cohen's delta of 0.5. Let's run an experiment. There we go. Here's our group of control people and experimental people with a mean and 95% confidence interval for each. I'm going to display a difference axis and the difference with a 95% confidence interval on that difference. And this first experiment happens to have estimated a difference that's pretty much spot on 10 points. Now since we're doing this simulation in the computer, we happen to know it's 10, but of course in real life research we won't. Let's do the experiment again. Ah, this time we estimated about eight points, okay? And the first result dropped down and the second result is here. Now, let me uh, run this. And there we have the dance of the confidence intervals. Successive experiments, each has given us an estimate of the difference and each estimate has a 95% confidence interval on it. Now this bouncing around here is exactly what we expect. It's exactly what any book that explains confidence intervals well will picture or tell us about in simulation. And in fact the definition of a confidence interval, as you may know, is that it's one from a sequence like this, an infinite sequence, 95% of which will capture the true value. So we can turn on the true value here at 10 and look down here and it looks like, well, all these 25 do in fact capture uh, the um, true effect size of 10. If we ran it further, we'd find the occasional one that didn't, 5% didn't. Now let's think about p-values. So we'll clear this and uh, we'll turn on p-values in a moment. But first I want to uh, demonstrate how I'm going to classify p-values. I'm going to do it in terms of the stars that we used before. And so here we go, three stars. Happy. Two stars. Pretty happy. One star. Okay, relieved, positive. Between 05 and 10. Do you want to hear this last one? No, you don't. Okay. Okay. Right. Now, let's um, uh, turn on the sound here and turn on the uh, clear and turn on p-values and run an experiment. Aha. Now, this experiment happened to estimate a difference of around about 12 on this floating differences scale. The confidence interval missed the null hypothesis zero, so we know that p is going to be less than 05. In fact, it's about 0.02 here. So let's do the experiment again. And this time we estimated about four. The confidence interval easily overlapped the null hypothesis value of zero, and so we have a p-value of about 0.4. Let's run this. So here we've got the dance of the confidence intervals, exactly as we did before. Now here we've got the dance of the p-values. And look what an extreme range of values we get. Everything from 0.000, 0 .000 up to 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0
0 0.7, 0 0.01. It looks like just about any value at all we can get here. Now, remember that when we do an experiment, we take just one from this dance, one from these dances. It's like closing your eyes and grabbing off the screen just a single row, a single one of these results. Now, if I tell you about the confidence interval on that row, does it tell you anything about the whole dance? Let's do just one. OK, there. Does that interval tell you anything about the whole dance? Yes, it does, because the extent of that interval tells you something about the extent of the bouncing around. But if I give you just that single p-value, does that tell you anything about the whole sequence of p-values? Virtually nothing, I would argue. Uh, now, I'm going to speed this up and turn off the sound. You'll be relieved to hear. And then collect a histogram here of the p-values. And that will build up. And you won't be able to see the numbers here. But in the long run, we expect about 10% of three stars and 36% of um, p greater than 1 0. The, here we have the distribution of the p-value for this particular experiment when we've got a uh, population effect size of 0.5 and we've got um, two groups of 32. And we can adjust these things to get different power. And if we do that, for example, if we increase the population effect size there, we're now up to power of 0.85, we change the distribution of the p-values as you would expect. But the important conclusion is that for any situation, we have a very wide range of, um, uh, of p-values. There's great uncertainty in p. So let's um, go back here. The dance of the p-values is very drunk and very wide. There are two YouTube videos that um, uh, demonstrate this. If you replicate, the sort of interval you need is not 0406, but <coughs> it is as wide as 0 0.408 to 0 0.44. And there's a paper here about these p intervals. If you get a very low p value like 001, well, sure, you're more likely to get lower values, but the p interval is still enormously wide. So a p value gives you only extremely vague information about what's going to happen next time. Oh, oh dear, sorry, that's the, that's, that's the cute grandchild problem I have in this computer. I'll rush on. So this is what we're doing in our science often is crunching numbers and coming out with p-values. The trouble is that they tell us very little. The implications of this variability of p, well, textbooks have lots about sampling variability of means and confidence intervals, but I have yet to find one that even mentions variability of p. Perhaps we should require people, when they report a p-value, to tell us the interval. So from this first section, what can I conclude? Broadly speaking, at least in some simple examples, p-values can mislead, tempt us into unjustified conclusions, whereas confidence intervals can inform us uh, more accurately and give us better information. The confidence interval includes information about the uncertainty. The length of the interval is important information about sampling variability, what's likely to happen next time, whereas a p-value has no such information associated with it. And so we can easily uh, mislead ourselves to believe that we have something very precise. A p-value does indicate strength of evidence, but it doesn't indicate its unreliability. True, p-values and confidence intervals are closely linked, but that doesn't mean they're the same. Confidence intervals do give us more information. A confidence interval estimates the size of an effect, which is actually what we want to know. And overall, estimation is more informative than dichotomous significance testing. So they're the take-home messages of this first section. And um, I suspect we have time for about one and a half questions. A couple of questions. Yes. 
down here, right in the hardest place to get a microphone. Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering, one of the very known problem with p-values is that people tend to hunt for significance because they have this dichotomous thinking that you pointed out and they really want to find an effect. And you also see this very much in the phenomenon publication bias. So significant p-values or significant results have a higher probability of getting published. And I was wondering if you think that if we uh, start using confidence intervals instead of p-values, if the, this, this problem of publication bias and an over uh, representation of significant results, if that would be solved? Aha, excellent question, and that is the topic for section two. In response to the particular question, I think uh, confidence intervals solving it is a bit ambitious, but I certainly do think it would help a lot. And you're absolutely right to um, put your finger on the sort of distortions that our reliance on p-values uh, has, uh, has led to, absolutely. Now, one more question in the back row. Thank you. I was just wondering if we could provide that confidence interval for the p-value so that we could present here's the p and here's the range that we would predict for the future so the p could give us something about the future instead of that one moment. Uh, yes, certainly um, that's an interesting suggestion. And I think, yes, here, should we require the reporting of p intervals? Actually, I wouldn't call it a confidence interval on p because there's no true population value of p that we're estimating. So this is why I talk about prediction intervals. And the intervals that I... Um, uh, I displayed here, they're actually 80% intervals. You've got an 80% chance of getting P in a replication within this interval. And so if, for example, we required people to put the P interval down there, so 04, well, actually, I mean, somewhere between 0 and 0 0.2 doesn't really seem to cut it so much, does it? And yet, that's a justifiable way to qualify what you, um, what you report when you report a P value. So, section one, big questions about p-values. Next section, we'll go on to talk about further reasons for reform and, in particular, research integrity. So, thank you. <laughs>